Hello, and welcome to Film Rant. Today I'm going to review a movie that I've looked forward to since I first heard about it, 10 Cloverfield Lane, which to be honest was only about 8 weeks ago. Now straight off I'll explain that this is not necessarily a Cloverfield sequel. Director Dan Trachtenberg describes it as a blood relative to Cloverfield. What he means by that is that it's sort of in the same realm but the events of Cloverfield haven't happened in the movie. Any future Cloverfield movies are all chained but as an anthology of unrelated events. Sort of like how the Twilight Zone works. The only way I can think to describe it in film terms is by using Edgar Wright's Cornetto trilogy. Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz and The World's End are linked by two main things, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, and, well, Cornettos. They are semi-related, but in the context of the films they don't really speak to each other. The only thing I can think of that will link the Cloverfield movies together is that they're all about someone's personal hell during an apocalyptic event. Right, with that out of the way I'll give warning that this review contains many many spoilers and even if you aren't bothered by spoilers I strongly advise that you see the movie first and then watch this review. The best aspect of the movie is mystery and that's going to be thrown out the window in this review. Right, let's go on. So Mary Elizabeth Winstead plays our protagonist Michelle. Michelle stood out to me as a bit of a mismatch character. Her profession before she ends up in John Gunman's bunker is a fashion designer, Jesus Christ that's hard to say, or at least that's what she wanted to be. From what I can gather, her actual profession must have been the Cloverfield universe's Bear Grylls. She's got survival pretty much sussed. She makes some handy tools out of the objects at her disposal and puts together some pretty smart traps and setups to try and escape. She's either very, very smart or has done this kind of thing before. I don't really think a regular person would be able to formulate some of the plans she thinks of, but I can let that slide. After all, this film would be pretty shit if she was useless, right? Michelle is actually very quiet, and we only really learn about her through some visual storytelling in the intro, which I'll discuss later, and some of the dialogue she has with Emmett. She's broke up with her fiancé or husband, ran away, and then ended up in the bunker. She could have had a bit more backstory, but it wasn't essential. She's a very easy character to get behind. There's a reason that Mary Elizabeth Winstead was hired for this role, though. She has the ability to tell stories with her eyes. We see it in Scott Pilgrim... <laughs> and it's ever more present in this movie. There's a scene in which she, Howard and Emmett are eating dinner around a table and her eyes inform the audience of her plan. She's also able to convey a mix of emotions with her eyes, which is also put to use. I think Dan wanted to tell a lot of this story visually, and he does so very well with the use of Mary Elizabeth Winstead's Big Browns. The film is absolutely bolstered by the magnificent performance of John Goodman as Howard. Trachtenberg issues a lot of mystery and suspense in the movie with camera work, music and editing, but John Goodman delivers his dialogue so perfectly that you just can't work out his character for a good while. And again, that's down to Dan's direction. You never know if Howard has abducted Michelle or if there is a genuine apocalypse outside and he saved her. At least for the first half of the movie or so. At first, Howard comes across like a very strange fella who's abducted Michelle. Once he lets her have free reign of the bunker, he becomes a sort of strict father figure. Once Michelle tries to escape and sees that there might in fact be an apocalyptic event happening, Howard comes clean with her and becomes a more lovable but tragic father figure. Eventually we learn that he's kidnapped Michelle in order to replace his daughter Megan, who he may or may not have killed. There's some nice signifiers to this, such as when he gets her some clothes to wear that were Megan's and when he can't say little women in the guessing game they play, he can only say little girl or little princess, which is obviously something you'd call your young daughter. The only issue I have with him is that he seems to change too abruptly for me. He seems to suddenly become nice when we want him to be nice, and bad again when the plot needs him to be bad. It's hard to explain, but it feels like the lovable tragic father version of Howard just doesn't exist in the first creepy captor or strict father version of Howard. I think he's just a bit too inconsistent. His character is the crux of the movie though, and John Goodman puts on a stellar performance. He's chock full of mystery, he's threatening, and also very lovable at times. It's hard to create a character that can mix up and evoke so many emotional reactions, especially in a 1 hour 45 minute movie. My only question to you, the audience, is did he deliberately abduct Michelle to replace Megan and the world just happened to end at the same time? Or did he genuinely know that the world was going to end and saved her, eventually turning her into his pseudo daughter? I don't think it's ever made perfectly clear, but I'd go with the first option. With regards to the script, it's very clear why J.J. Abrams got in contact with Dan Trachtenberg to direct this. Ten Cloverfield Lane is Trachtenberg's first feature film. He's directed two short films, Kickin' in 2003 and Portal No Escape in 2011, which is a short film based on the popular puzzle game Portal. I'm sure some of you will have seen that short. If you haven't, I'll post a link in the description below and I advise you to watch it. It's a pretty neat little short and it nails the vibe of Portal. I mention this because if you've just watched Portal or have seen it before, you can see 
see some big similarities between that and Cloverfield Lane. The film is mostly about a woman waking up in a dimly lit room with no obvious means of escape and she has to work her way out of it. Both films also deal with what it's like to be trapped in an enclosed space for a certain period of time. Dan's camera work and editing for Portal evoke claustrophobia and tension, and that's exactly what Cloverfield Lane needed. Cloverfield had claustrophobia in the sense that everything was handheld and you were forced to see everything from a certain perspective. 10 Cloverfield Lane uses multiple third person camera angles, but the set and angles make the film claustrophobic. Cloverfield Lane hinged on mystery, character engagement and tension, and Dan showed he can do all three of those things in his short, and he definitely pulls off all three in his first feature. This guy can create some damn good shit. Now that I've mentioned tension, I'm going to focus on it entirely for the next minute or so. Tension is absolutely what holds this film together. If you went into this film knowing what was or was not outside, knowing the truth behind Howard's character, and knowing whether or not Michelle survived, it would be totally ruined. I've held off watching it a second time because honestly, I think it'll ruin my love for the movie. It's a bit like that game Alien Noir. If anybody has played it, you'll know what I mean. It's fun to play the first time as you don't know who done what and why, but if you replay it, all the mystery is gone and there doesn't seem to be any stakes anymore. Does the fact that 10 Cloverfield Lane might be a one-time thing ruin the movie? No, not necessarily. I don't think I'd think it's a bad movie if I watched it again, but I certainly wouldn't find it as mysterious and gripping. The same thing happened with The Maze Runner. I was so intrigued as to why the guys were in the maze and whether they'd get out or not. It was gripping stuff. I watched it a second time, and while it was still good, it was nowhere near as good as I watched it the first time. Anyway, 10 Cloverfield Lane always keeps you guessing. You find yourself asking lots of questions like, is Howard just a psycho? Is there really an apocalypse outside? If there is, what is it? Uh, chemicals? A monster? Aliens? Zombies? Howard says it's chemicals, but can he be trusted? Is Emmett in cahoots with Howard and the both serial killers? Was the lady who bangs on the door part of Howard's plan? Did Howard murder Megan? Is Michelle dead? A film that makes you question literally every motivation, character and situation in it is a damn good thriller to me. In particular, there's a fantastic scene in which Howard, Michelle and Emmett are playing a game of Who Am I? The scene takes place after Michelle and Howard have been developing a hazmat suit that they can use when they try to escape. Howard begins his character by saying sinisterly, I see everything. I'm always watching. I know what you did. As he says this, Emmett begins to crack and the editing starts getting quicker and tighter on people's faces until eventually Michelle shouts, Santa Claus! You're, you're Santa Claus! Howard then happily says, yes, she got it. That scene was absolutely fantastic. That was simply Dan Trachtenberg deciding to completely troll the audience for his own sadistic pleasure. Dan, you're a masochist twat, but I love it. Give me more of that hurt, you dirty bitch. And... Uh, Okay, uh, yeah, that got weird. But part of what kept me guessing about everything even more is the slogan for the movie. Cloverfield and 10 Cloverfield Lane have been praised for their extremely clever marketing, where they include cryptic messages in posters, trailers and websites and include little easter eggs and such. However, what grabbed my attention was much more obvious than that. A buddy of mine mentioned that since the term Cloverfield is now an anthology, what if each Cloverfield movie contained a different apocalyptic event? Zombies, monsters, aliens, biological warfare, natural disasters, etc, etc. So the main slogan for 10 Cloverfield Lane, Monsters come in many forms, struck a strong chord with me. To me that implies that outside the bunker is not the monster from Cloverfield or even a monster at all, it could be anything. Now that's much more interesting to me than a direct sequel could have ever been. A lot of people are asking for a Cloverfield 2 which either shows a monster attacking a different city, humans fighting back against it, or the same events from Cloverfield 1 from a different viewpoint. That's all well and good, but an entirely separate monster movie grabs my interest a little more. That slogan also allowed me to sort of assume that Howard was the monster in this movie. Monsters indeed come in many forms. They could be giant beasts attacking New York, or they could be an abusive captor who is ruining your life. It's never confirmed whether Howard is that man until late on in the movie, but the suspicion was always there for me because of that single slogan. That upped the mystery and suspense in the movie for me tenfold. However, when Michelle escapes, I did feel a little disappointed that he may be the only monster in the movie. I wanted Michelle to get outside and say something utterly devastating and so should be fucked either way, because I'm such a positive and supporting person like that. And that's exactly what we got. Kind of. Michelle escapes the bunker and spends the last 15 minutes of the movie or so out running some phallic aliens and eventually getting away and heading to Houston. It's fine that aliens are introduced, and it's fine that Michelle has to tackle them. What isn't fine is that the ending is about as clunky as a tap dancing drag queen. I can't decide if the ending is too long or not long enough. I think it's somewhere in the middle, which is a pretty bad place to me. 
For me, I think the ending had to either be Michelle climbing out of the bunker, seeing a massive UFO laying waste to the earth, we see a reaction shot of her, then a wide shot of the whole scene showing multiple huge UFOs taken over. Then the audience is left to decide if she survives or not. If not that ending, then have Michelle escape the bunker much earlier and then split the film into two halves. The first half is the human monster and Howard, and the second half the aliens. Personally, I'd prefer the first ending I proposed, as I think it's a much stronger ending. Instead, we get a new monster introduced 15 minutes before the end that isn't really explored or dealt with in any meaningful way. Michelle has a mild struggle and then drives off to Houston to fight back. It sets up a direct sequel, but given what Dan and JJ have said about the Cloverfield anthology, that doesn't make much sense. Cloverfield should just be movies about personal hell during an apocalypse, which this movie was. If it ended with her climbing out the bunker and spotting a huge UFO, then this movie would be a 5 star for me. But but the clunky ending really harms the final score. One element that Dan wanted to add into this movie was fun. He wanted it to be tense and scary, but also have a bit of fun. And I have to say that the comedy in 10 Cloverfield Lane is fairly solid. Howard is an unnervingly funny character. Just some of the things he says and the way he says them are enough to make you have a good chuckle. There was a group of teenagers behind me who were laughing at him way before he was actually meant to be funny, so maybe he was funnier than I give him credit for. Dan also utilises visual comedy very well, such as the scene where Michelle and Emmett are talking around a jukebox and Howard walks in and shakes his ass to some tunes. Dan isn't as good with visual comedy as Edgar Wright, but he can do it well. Not enough directors do it these days, so I'm looking forward to seeing what he does in the future. To draw yet another similarity to Edgar Wright, 10 Cloverfield Lane shares a feature that is also present in Shaun of the Dead, and that is that not a single line of dialogue is wasted. Every line in Cloverfield Lane either advances the plot naturally or gives character depth somewhat. The dialogue is as gripping as it is in The Hateful Eight, and it actually serves its proper purpose. It never feels like a character is rambling or saying pointless information. Each conversation is meaningful and gives the audience a lot of information. The movie was written by Josh Campbell and Matthew Sturken. Sturken. Fuck it. So the dialogue was mostly written by them. But Dan ultimately chooses what goes in the final cut, so if there was any fat, Dan certainly trimmed it off. I mentioned Trachtenberg does a good job implementing visual comedy. While there's a lot of dialogue, he is also very good at implementing visual storytelling. There is times where you could mute the movie and you'd perfectly understand what is happening. The beginning especially demonstrates this skill. We learn quite a lot about Michelle's character without her uttering a word. We see her packing up her bags and we see the objects that are in her house. We're asking ourselves, what's she packing for? Who's she talking to on the phone? And that is all answered in one shot at the end when we see her wedding ring left on the table. We also see good visual storytelling at the dinner scene where we follow Mary Elizabeth Winstead's lovely big eyes down and to the left, which is then cut to a shot of the keys on Howard's belt. It's too easy to tell all the story through dialogue without doing anything visually. Trachtenberg marries dialogue and visuals perfectly to make a really solid movie. To coincide with that, I'll state that Cloverfield Lane has some very nice cinematography at times and it's shot in such a way to create a feeling of claustrophobia and suspense. One particular scene stood out to me as it was great how Trachtenberg used colour. There is a scene where Michelle is talking to Emmett through her room wall. When we see Michelle talking, the camera is at the side of her head and she's looking into the bottom right corner. In the background, the wall is entirely pink. The reverse shot of Emmett is identical except the wall is entirely blue. It's very gender stereotypical but it looks quite cool. The camera moves into a straight flat shot of their head whenever they tell a very personal story that delves into who they are as a person. It was some very subtle camera work but it worked so well. It pulls you into their characters and you hang on every word. I love that scene and the cinematography in general is very good. Speaking of pink, check out this shot. Howard is sat on the pink side of the wall with the light on, which I'm guessing is painted that way because he wanted to make it like a girl's bedroom. Michelle is on the grey side of the wall with the light off, because she's not enlightened about the events of outside yet and she sees the bunker as a drab grey prison. Later on in the movie, after Michelle has seen the events outside, Howard replaces that bulb and then both lights are on. Many erections are to be had over shots like this. Finally, I want to express some praise to Trachtenberg for not copping out when it comes to the scary moments. I absolutely hate horror films with a passion. You will never see me review a horror film on this channel. That is because I absolutely cannot stand jump scares. They are literally worse than Hitler. I know not all horrors have them, but the ones that do can fuck off and burn in hell, to be honest. Anyway, Trachtenberg manages to successfully create suspense without resorting to cheap jump scares to frighten the audience. Mostly. There is one instance of it where the woman slams into the bunker doors, Michelle is looking out, but other than that, Dan had many opportunities to execute a jump scare and he didn't. You, sir, are a hero and a saint. 
After all, isn't the suspense and uncertainty more scary than the actual scare itself? It's much scarier not knowing what's around the corner than knowing there's a monster around the corner. That's the whole idea of the original Cloverfield. That's why the monster is obscured for most of the movie. So well done, Dan, for focusing more on suspense and the unknown than cheap bullshit jump scares. So to summarise, I'd say that 10 Cloverfield Lane is a perfectly solid thriller. I loved every minute until the clunkily delivered ending. If the ending was a little longer or shorter, this movie would get a straight 5 stars, but alas, the ending ruins it a bit. However, that is the only flaw in an otherwise extremely enjoyable movie that has some great characters, fantastic dialogue, good comedy and nice visuals. I can completely understand if some people are disappointed by this because it's not a direct sequel to Cloverfield and doesn't feature the original monster, but I loved it as a standalone thriller. I'm not sure it'll live up to the same standards on a second viewing, but certainly on first viewing it's an extremely good film. I can't wait to see what comes next in the Cloverfield anthology or from Dan Trachtenberg. Both have exciting potential. 10 Cloverfield Lane gets 4 frames out of 5. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Film Rant. It doesn't seem